I, ju I just spent the afternoon with uh, uh, Jeremy Hammond uh, in the MCC. I know Michael's seen Jeremy quite a bit. Um, and I went with Michael, was it, when was it, what month was it, a few months ago, to see Julian Assange in London. Um, and the persecution of <clears throat> those with the physical ability to break down the firewalls and shine a light on the inner workings of power uh, has become uh, extremely frightening uh, to those of us who have spent our career as journalists. Uh, I was with the New York Times for 15 years. I was an investigative reporter for the Times. I was o overseas. I was in Latin America, uh, the Middle East for seven years, uh, and I covered the war in Sarajevo. But in the end, uh, uh, I covered Al-Qaeda after 9-11 based in Paris. And as an investigative reporter, I frequently published top secret information. That's my job as a reporter. Uh, without the ability and the independence of the press to hold power accountable, uh, and without the legal protection that traditionally we have had, uh, then uh, power can in essence drop a kind of wall around itself and carry out uh, all sorts of criminal activity, which of course is what has happened. Uh, the rise of the corporate state, uh, which preceded Barack Obama, uh, essentially has created a system by which all regulation, all legal protection, all impediments to the abuse of power have been obliterated. And uh, that's why the Obama administration's assault on civil liberties has been far more egregious than the assault carried out by George W. Bush. And as a reporter, uh, I have seen uh, since the Obama uh, presidency in 2009, uh, in essence, a complete silencing uh, within the mainstream press of uh, any kind of reporting out of the national security state. Uh, if the Obama administration, uh, through a radical interpretation, and I think most lawyers, and, you know, Kate and Michael obviously can speak to this, uh, of the 2001 Authorization to Use Military Force Act as giving the executive branch the right to assassinate American citizens, the FISA Amendment Act, which retroactively made legal what under our Constitution had traditionally been illegal, the warrantless wiretapping, monitoring, and eavesdropping of, when we know from Snowden, almost all Americans, and the storage of our personal data in perpetuity in supercomputers in places like Utah, uh, the use of the Espionage Act or misuse of the Espionage Act to shut down whistleblowers seven times, Snowden being the latest example. Uh, and I speak, I just spoke uh, the other day to a friend of mine who's still on the Times and who still does investigative reporting, and she said basically nobody will talk, even on background anymore. It is impossible. And I think one of the reasons that Snowden uh, not only left the United States, uh, but uh, went public is because he knew that the NSA had all of Glenn Greenwald's electronic communications uh, and that there was no place to hide. Now, if there is not a Snowden or a Manning uh, or a Julian Assange or a Jeremy Hammond, there is no free press. Um, and this is what's so frightening, and as some of you may know, uh, I sued the president uh, in the Southern District Court of New York over Section 1021 of the National Defense Authorization Act. Um, for those who don't know, uh, Section 1021, uh, overturning 150 years of domestic law, uh, permits the military to seize American citizens, in essence, carry out extraordinary rendition on the streets of the United States. Uh, anybody who substantially supports that, not material support, substantially support is not a legal term, is it? No, it's an amorphous term, intentionally. Substantially supports Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, or again, another nebulous term, associated forces, um, can hold them in military facilities, including our offshore penal colonies, uh, indefinitely, and strip them of due process. Uh, it's an utterly terrifying piece of legislation that had bipartisan support uh, within the Congress. The original bill was sponsored by Levin and McCain, 
Uh, we won, surprisingly. Uh, I think Michael was surprised. Um, <laughs> we were all surprised. Um, two great lawyers, Bruce Afron and Carl Mayer. Uh, and the 170-page ruling by Judge Catherine B. Forrest is really worth reading because it is, it's, and I think she wrote it in a way to be accessible to the wider public, where she speaks about the utter obliteration of the separation of powers. Um, that, uh, in, in essence, the judiciary, the legislative, and the executive have completely surrendered to corporate interests. And then, of course, corporate power, courtesy of um, uh, Bill Clinton, through the deregulation of the FCC, has consolidated, especially the electronic media, into the hands of a half dozen corporations, Viacom, General Electric, Rupert Murdoch's News Corp, Clear Channel, etc. cetera. And, um, and, and so this erosion, which has been accelerated under the Obama administration has created a situation where holding power accountable, which is the fundamental job of the press, has become utterly impossible. And you see the attacks on Greenwald, the attacks on Greenwald's partner, uh, the attacks on Jim Risen, uh, who uh, may go to jail, uh, a reporter for the New York Times, because they are demanding to know what his sources are. Um, uh, is essentially creating a situation uh, that uh, Sheldon Woolen in his great book Democracy Incorporated calls a system of inverted totalitarianism. And that, by that he means that it's not classical totalitarianism, it doesn't find its expression through a demagogue or a charismatic leader, uh, but through the anonymity of the corporate state. That in a classical totalitarian regime you have a reactionary or revolutionary party that seizes the structure and changes it. In inverted totalitarianism, you have corporate forces that purport to pay fealty to electoral politics, the constitution, the iconography of American patriotism, and yet internally have seized all of the levers of power. Uh, and that's really where we are. Um, we, are uh, we have moved into a situation whereby power no longer is accountable. And the persecution of those few individuals like Hammond, like Manning, like Assange, who uh, through tremendous personal sacrifice and courage have stood up uh, to try and uh, shine a light on uh, the inner workings of power uh, have been uh, either sentenced in the case of Manning to uh, you know, insane amounts of time and it, you know, this horrible judge uh, looks set to give Hammond uh, the full uh, ten year sentence. Uh, Ham Assange of course is uh, in essence living in uh, a kind of limbo in the Ecuadorian <laughs> embassy in uh, London, and, uh, and we see uh, Snowden essentially having to go into exile. And uh, this has created a situation by which the formal mechanisms of the state, the ability to create piecemeal and incremental reform, which is essentially what is supposed to happen in democratic capitalism, has been seized. It doesn't work anymore. And uh, it has exposed, essentially, corporate power, which is global. I mean, I think one of the things the Stafford leaks that Hammond uh, provided showed is that complete fusion between corporate and state power. That these uh, security agencies, and Stafford is a private security firm, are working on behalf of the very corporate interests. Uh, so that if you challenge uh, ExxonMobil, uh, it becomes as dangerous as challenging the NSA. Um, and, and what's fascinating, and again you saw that through the uh, leaks, is how uh, the very figures will uh, leap back and forth between corporate and government, that there's no distinction anymore, including in terms of their security clearances. Um, and so one of the things that, and when we had the trial with the NDA, one of the co-plaintiffs, Alex O'Brien, uh, because of that email dump, uh, was able to show how Stafford was attempting to link her organization, U.S. Day of Rage, with Al-Qaeda. That's what they do. They create terrorism laws. The template, of course, is the war on drugs. But they create laws of terrorism, and then uh, they use, uh, essentially, create omnipotent police forces, which anybody who lives in a marginal community, uh, especially uh, African-American community, understands you create omnipotent police forces. And Hannah Arendt, when she writes Origins of Totalitarianism, actually talks about that phenomenon. Because in <clears throat> Nazi, uh, with the rise of Nazi Germany, you had numerous stateless people, including Arendt, 
<coughs> who arrive in countries like France, and uh, the, the power of the police, because they're stateless, because essentially they have no passport, they have no legal rights, the power of the police is very much like the power of police uh, that has uh, uh, taken place in marginal communities where, and Michelle Alexander sort of did the book on it, where the doors can be kicked down, um, uh, you can, uh, on, you, there's any kind of pretext, people can be seized. Uh, what's happened against, uh, you know, the, the kind of broad police powers that are brought against undocumented workers, all of these things are now being brought against activists in the name of the war on terror. Um, and in essence, we've been stripped of any ability, uh, both within the formal structures of power, as well as the judiciary and the legal system by which we can fight back. Uh, and that's why I think that the work of people like him, like Assange, like Manny, is so important because they've realized that the only hope we have left is to step outside the system uh, and begin to carry out acts that are, uh, you know, and we can go back and read Thoreau about this, that are technically criminal. I, I debated, um, um, what was the name of that guy from Chicago Law School? What was his name? Um, the dean of, it's on, you can, on YouTube, on Democracy Now!, but the dean of Chicago Law School. And of course, what they were saying that, you know, what, what his argument was that what Snowden did was a crime. Well, in a technical sense, yes. And what Manning did, in a technical sense, was a crime. But you have to set that against the greater crime of the war crimes that were being committed that a figure like Manning exposed. Um, and you can take just the collateral murder video. Uh, where I think there are three egregious violations of international law, firing on unarmed civilians, firing on children, and firing on people who attempted unarmed to rescue the wounded. Um, and yet the pilots who carried out that attack um, have never been disciplined or never punished. And Chelsea Manning is facing uh, 35 years in prison, and I think the mainstream press was a little disingenuous when they talked about the fact that she could be up for parole in seven years. That's true, um, but it's almost 100% certain that no military court in seven years is going to release her. And I think that um, essentially we have entered a, a state, uh, a, a totalitarian system, a corporate totalitarianism, where the only effective forms of resistance, the only way to fight back against uh, centers of power that are rapidly reconfiguring the country into a form of neo-feudalism. I mean, the, that glo the internal half of this country lives in poverty. Um, this global neo-feudalism, this global security and surveillance state is only going to be carried out by people who, in essence, are willing to break the law.